Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of The Christian Contrarian. I'm Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, and this is episode 40, The Curious Curse of Canaan. You know, from time to time, I get correspondence and communication coming to me asking, what the heck is going on in Genesis 9, and in particular, verses 21 through 27, where we get an encounter that seems to have found the necessity to rise to the level of being recorded in Scripture, but seems rather innocent. And the scene is essentially where Ham walks in on Noah and sees his nakedness, and that rises to a level of creating a curse. And a curse that's not towards Ham, but to Canaan, his youngest son. And so the story seems to be sort of wrapped in a riddle, so to speak, and obscured from what the heck is going on. Is And that's sort of the point of the whole show, is to talk about what is going on in these few short verses because there's a lot more relationships. There's a lot more things going on. There's a lot more things to consider that will ripple down through history, at least early post-Diluvian history and Israelite history, that is very, very important to understand. And so it does rise to the level of being put into Scripture and it requires we understand what is being communicated to us so that we can use that for context for other verses that are going to happen um, in Israelite history. And we need to look at the details and how those details explain what is going on and then how they connect with other passages that help explain what's going on. So what I'm going to do is just give some quick bullet points as a basis to start on. And then we're going to talk about that through this show. And I think people are going to find the, uh, the conclusion and as we walk through rather eye-opening, perhaps astonishing, perhaps shocking. And you may not agree with my particular point of conclusion, but you'll be at least in the zone. But I think when you see all of the context, you're going to see there's connections there that most people tend to overlook. And that's because we're not paying attention to enough of the details. So let's talk about some of the quick bullet points. So starting in Genesis 9.21, Noah drinks some wine. He becomes drunk. He Obviously, he passes out. And he is uncovered in his tent. In verse 22, Ham sees Noah's nakedness because he's uncovered in the tent. And then he tells his brothers about it, Shem and Japheth. In um, verse 23, they actually take a garment then and they walk in backwards and cover their eyes and cover both shoulders of Noah so that um, he's no longer uncovered. And that they do not, did not actually sort of witness that nakedness. And then in verse 24, Noah awakes. And he knows what has happened to him. Seemingly, somebody has put a blanket on him, which Shem and Japheth has done. But he knows instantly what had happened. Nobody tells him. He just understands instantly and that's the Hebrew word to know as in yada, not in a sexual sense here, although the irony is, is it may be part of that as we talk about going forward. And new means to ascertain, to understand, to, to discern, to learn. So as soon as Noah wakes up, he understands what has happened to him. And he it really upsets him. And then Noah curses Canaan. doesn't curse Ham. He seems to curse Canaan. And in verse 26, Canaan will serve Shem. And then in verse 27, Canaan is going to serve Shem and Japheth. 
And all of that, because Ham seemingly walks in on a, on a passed out Noah, sees him naked, and doesn't cover him up, and tells his brothers. And again, it's not Ham who is cursed. It's his youngest son. And, ha and Canaan isn't even born yet. Understand that they're still on the mountain when this happens. They haven't come out. And the families haven't been listed as talked about in Genesis 10. And you have this word curse that's being used. And what's interesting about that and how it sort of helps relate to where in the time frame on this, and as is, is, is most people would understand, I, I follow a very much a linear progression of the Bible. So nine comes before 10 in Genesis and the families have not been born yet or at least talked about. And curse is the Hebrew word arar, A-R-A-R -R, as we would understand it. Which is very interesting because the Noah's Ark comes to a landing on Mount Ararat. And so even though Strong's doesn't show one is connected to the other one, it seems that they are connected. And the name Mount Ararat may have been changed from what its original name was to represent what happened as the curse or the mountain curse of what happened to Canaan. So let's talk about some of the wording around Canaan in Genesis 9. So Canaan is the fourth son yet to be born. And he's going to be, have that name or at least have that name as recorded as the one that's going to receive the curse. And you need to understand it sort of in that context because a curse that has implications or an, 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 and a denunciation, so a denunciation and negative consequences and implications is like a prophecy, a prophecy of a curse. Similar to the curses that are recorded in the covenant that would happen and be fulfilled as prophecies if Israel didn't hold up the covenant. And so we have to go through this age through the avenue of the curses to have all things fulfilled as opposed to the blessings because Israel didn't fulfill their covenant, actually broke the covenant. So we need to understand in that context, and in that context, Canaan, who will actually take that name or have it reassigned to him, means lowland, merchant, and humiliated, which is an interesting term. And it's rooted in 3665, which is Kana, which means subdued and a servant. So one wonders whether or not there has been a name assigned to the denunciation of the curse. It seems quite likely that it was because Canaan is going to have the curse of being a servant to Shem and Japheth. The descendants thereof. And servant is the Hebrew word abed. And abed means slave and subjected. So it seems that perhaps the word, and more likely that the word may have been actually kana, which had, you know, would have been the word that was used to help in the definition of what the servant would be as being enslaved. And then that's the name that comes out in the form of Canaan, which is a derivative of Kana. So if you follow that sort of progression, it looks like there's a possibility that the name of Canaan wasn't that, and that name is assigned to them based on the curse Arar on Mount Ararat. So now that we've got some of those details um, understood, Let's start looking at some more of the metaphors that are in there because it, the language that's being used is what I would call allegorical. And so they, it, it has another meaning or it has a uh, metaphorical meaning to it. And we need to understand whether or not this is a metaphor like to know as in having sex as is used in the Sodom narrative that we're going to talk about and or with, you know, the, 
the begetting of the lineage of Cain and the lineage of Seth and through Adam to know, to, to, to have sex, to, to procreate. And so we need to understand the term uncovered. And once we start to understand that term, it's going to make some sense. So uncovered is the Hebrew word gala, which means to strip and denude and disgrace. And nakedness is the Hebrew word erva, meaning nude, exposed, and in genitals. And, and both are figurative for disgracing and blemishing. And so it's a figure, figurative set of words when used in conjunction with each other to represent forbidden sex. And where that now becomes important is many years down the road, once Israel, Israel becomes a nation and is about to go into the covenant land, uh, even though there's going to be a delay of 40 years, God sets down laws for Israel. And it's going to be connected to Canaan, but let's just focus on the laws for now. And those are the sexual laws of forbidden things to do that are recorded in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus 20. And the words of uncovered and nakedness are used throughout both of those chapters detailing all of the variations of the forbidden sexual laws. So now we're starting to open up our eyes a little bit that maybe there was more going on here than just being naked. And so when we look at Leviticus 20, 14, and 17, it's actually talking about forced sex and incest as being wicked. And in Leviticus 20, 11, 12, 18, and 20, we actually get the words being used as uncovered and nakedness in conjunction with some smoking gun verses, the ones that I just named, in terms of some other uh, words that are being used with, where this is talking about lying with somebody, as in sleeping with somebody, as in having sex with somebody. And so in, Levit and in Le Leviticus 18.20, it says lie carnally. And in 11, 12, 18, and 20, it's lie with your, your neighbor's wife, lie with your sister, lie with your mother, etc. So all of it is describing that kind of occurrence. And what we're learning is that if you were to sleep with your mother's wife, you would uncover your father's nakedness. And possibly one of the answers to what's going on in Genesis 9. But let's look a little bit more into the details because although that's one option, it may not be the right option. So when we look at Leviticus 18.16, it says, Do not approach any kin, male or female. And so we need to understand that this goes across the board in the sexes. And in Leviticus 18.18, 18, we're told, Do not take a wife to her sister and vex her. Don't take the you know your sister. Don't take the wife of of her sister and vex her. So uncover her nakedness. Sorry, I stumbled on that. And so what you're saying is is that is pointing out to specific individuals as to who's going to be having sex with. And then we need to understand how that affects. Who is being blemished? So in 18.7, it says, Do not uncover the nakedness of, of your mother or your father. Okay? So that if you were to have sex with your mother, you would uncover the nakedness of your father and vice versa. So it can happen both ways. Okay? And that's important to understand because... What we're going to learn now in, in the subsequent verses that... The one who is having 
uh, a sexual violation too willingly or unwillingly is being uncovered and there's repercussions to another as to who else is receiving that blemish or that uncovering of the nakedness. And so in verse Levit Leviticus 18, it says, do not uncover your father's wife's daughter. Again, your sister. Do not uncover your sister's nakedness. Okay, because now you're going to uncover that particular father's nakedness and you're going to uncover the sister's nakedness. So clearly there's two, be, two un, uncoverings that are involved with that sexual violation. And in verse 2017, it talks about uh, one taking to uncover the sister. He has uncovered her. So if you, again, that's just underlining that you can't just generically apply the uncoveredness to the person who it didn't happen to who is related that would affect their sort of standing without including the person that it is uh, happening to. And in verse 8, 20, Leviticus 20, 18, it says, uncover her sickness, uncovers her nakedness. So in that time of the month, if you were to have sexual with uh, intercourse with um, a female who's in that time of the month, then you would also uncover her nakedness, okay? So we have to understand the two different sort of blemishes that are going on there if we're going to understand what is going on with the actual sexual event. Not just assume that in this case, that it would go to, in Noah's case, that what is happening would be happening to Noah's wife, causing Noah to be uncovered. But we need to start understanding that the details of what's laid out in Leviticus is also pointing to the person who's had the sexual violation and they're uncovered as well. And with the way they do the wording in Leviticus 18 and 20, you've got two going on. And you have to understand that where the person is being violated, it's saying they're being violated as uncovered. It's quite direct as opposed to that secondary implication. And that's kind of the point there. So as we said, so either... Noah's being violated or his wife is being violated. That's what we need to understand as we look at the details again in Genesis 9. And keep in mind how the laws are written when it's, it's talking about the person being violated that, and how they're being violated, that they're explicitly said that that's the person who's violated and is uncovered. So in Genesis 9, 21, Noah drinks the wine and becomes drunk and uncovered. There's no mention of his wife. And it's in his tent, although his wife could possibly be there. And in verse 22, Noah again has his, Ham sees Noah's nakedness. And then he tells his brother about Noah's nakedness. So again, Noah is being talked about. And when Noah awakes, he knew what happened to him. Not to his wife. It says to him. And he instantly understood it. And it doesn't say anywhere in the text that his wife told him what happened to her. This is all about understanding the pronouns and the nouns and understanding that only Noah is being talked about and receiver of the direct action of the sexual violation with the allegorical language being used. And we need to understand that. And so it would appear that Ham uncovered his father's nakedness directly. And thus... That would be a curse, a sin worthy of a curse and a prophecy of implication. And we need to understand where Canaan settled and who they settled with. 
And so in Genesis 14, we understand that the Canaanites are grouped in amongst the land of the promised land and a very heavy, heavily weighted to a, a number of Canaanites that are under five kings that are involved in the Genesis 14 War of Giants uh, accounting. And included in that are the Sodom kings who are the vassal, those five kings are the vassals of Ketelaramar. So we see a little bit of that curse coming forward, that as being vassals, they're serving Semites, just as Shem was attributed to being one that Ham or Canaan more specifically would be serving. And so when we look at what's going on there, and then we start to understand that Sodom is a very interesting place, and I'm, and I'm going to come back to that. I want to cover off just a couple more things, but I get ahead of myself sometimes because I get excited, so forgive me for that. And so you have Genesis uh, 10, you have the families of Canaan that are listed. And you get the two offspring of Canaan, who are Heth and Sidon. And then this whole list of other branches and families of Canaanites who are patriarch-less. So Canaan would be the patriarch for Canaanites. Heth would be the patriarch for Hittites. Sidon would be for the Zidonians. And on and on and on, all throughout the Table of Nations, the patriarch is the founder of the nation that the nation takes the name of patronymically. But these ones have no names. And I think what's going on here is that the Canaanites are not wanting to be in perpetual servitude to Japheth and, and Shem and all of their nations and descendants. And so they're going to partner with the Raphaim the giants. And none of the giants' names as patriarchs, whether it's Rapha or it's Arba and other ones that um, are yet to be discovered that provide the names patronymically for these families, the patriarchs aren't listed. None of the Raphaim are listed. So in terms of the table of nations and the patriarchs. And so these patriarchless Canaanite families seemingly are offspring hybrids of the Raphaim. And they would have done that to strengthen themselves and to have the protection of these giants and to create a larger hybrid race to fend off these other nations who are always uh, prophesied to enslave them. And I think that was an answer to what they were trying to do. And what's interesting about the word families is that is the word uh, mishpaka which means class or species or kind or tribe and you need to apply the right application and i think the right application here because they're patriarch less and likely with the raphaim you have created a different kind of nation a hybrid nation and thus the raphaim patriarchs name that they're named after are not listed and then we move over to Genesis 15, right after Genesis 14, where the, the Sodom um, events took place. You have many of these nations that are listed in the Mighty Seven. And in Genesis 15, you have the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites listed along with two others, the Raphaim, which are obviously the giants, and also the Perizim. And then later on in Deuteronomy 7.1 and other places you get the Mighty Seven, but the Raphaim has been replaced by the Hivites, another hybrid tribe of Canaan. And I think what's going on here is, is that they're the mighty ones because they are hybrids. They're not as big and as strong as the Raphaim, but they are large. And that word mighty in the mighty seven, as it's talked about in Deuteronomy 7 and in Joshua, is the Hebrew word atzam, 
which means strong, mighty, powerful, and rooted in the word atzum, which is strong as in bone crushing, the ability to crush bones in your hands. That's how powerful these families were. And so the Canaanite nations took on a level of size and ferocity, I think, in response to the curse and prophecy that they would be servants. And I think that was what uh, inspired them to do that uh, because they were tired of being a cursed uh, set of people. And then when we look at Israelites are moving into this land that is dominated by these hybrids and by the Anakim and the Raphaim and other uh, Raphaim branches like the Avim and the Hivim and the Horim and on and on and on with all of these different names that are interacting within the covenant land, you have a set of laws that are going to be given to Israel. Uh, in Leviticus 18 and 20. And what it says in 18.3 is that these are laws because of the people who lived there before and what they did. And it actually says the crimes of the land of Canaan and Egypt where they came from, which is Ham, although Egypt didn't receive the, the servitude curses, they actually became an empire and one of the more powerful empires, so it's strictly connected to Cain, but they did similar type of crimes. And these are the sexual crimes that follow in Leviticus 18 and 20 that Israel is told they can't do all of the crimes that, all of the crimes that the Canaanites did. And that includes lying with other men. And that is covered off in both Leviticus 18 and 20 to underline that that's an abomination. So a curse worthy, a crime worthy of the curse. Now in Genesis 19, we get the story of the destruction of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the and the other cities aligned with them. And that's the Hebrew word Saddam meaning burning because of the sulfur that rained down on them for their crimes. And the etymology of sodomy that goes along with the crimes of homose homosexuality is meaning the sins of Sodom. So Sodom doesn't actually mean it, but that's the sins accredited to Sodom. So Sodom, Gomorrah, the cities of the plain within the Canaanite Pentapolis and probably elsewhere throughout the land had the crimes of, of Sodom, which were the crimes of Canaan that are covered off in Leviticus 18 and 20. And in 19.5, you have the men of Sodom saying, bring out the men, which were angels, so that they could know them, so and know them in the terms of sexually, just as we talked about earlier. And so they're trying to either have sex with people that they know are men, and or they're trying to have sex with the men who are angels that they know are angels. And both are things we need to consider as to what is going on there. And so Jude 1.7 gives us a little bit more clarification where it talks about the people of Sodom going after strange flesh and doing this through fornication. So being given over to fornication and going after strange flesh. And strange means uh, different, other, another kind, another species, as, and that's the Greek word heteros. So I'm thinking here it's meaning either both, as sort of a double meaning there because the angels were in the form of men and they're a different race, a different being. And that's the strange flesh that is being talked about. And that this is the defiling of their flesh by breaking these kinds of laws, uh, which is um, the word, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, means contaminate. And the word flesh is the word sarx in Greek, which means of the body, of, of the flesh. So all of the words are forming. This is an abomination that is going on in Sodom. 
part of the crimes of Canaan and seemingly the part of the crime that links, that's the most abominable portion of it that goes back to what Ham did in Genesis 9. And then we need to understand that although we don't get accounts of it in the Bible, we hear about accounts in polytheist versions and apocry apocryphal accounts where there was a reproduction issue with the giants and homosexuality was actually prominent. And one of the accounts, which is the, of the, the book of Lamech of Cain, although not scriptural, and it's part of the book of Og through the Manichaean book of giants that's linked to the Enochian book of giants, has something very interesting and similar to talk about. And I thought I would include it. So in the book of Lamech of Cain in chapter 8, verse 10, it talks about Nephilim went after strange flesh because there were so few women. And then in verse 14, it actually uses the terms uncovered and nakedness and of the mothers and of the fathers. And these are all the laws that they were breaking that are listed in Leviticus, into the sexual laws. And... We need to understand that those are the laws that were the behaviors and the abominations of both the Canaanites and the Raphaim, which were the post diluvian giants. And that's part of the curse, and that's part of the destruction of Sodom, and that's why you had that prophetic curse that was going on. And that's why Israel had to cleanse the land of the giants and the abominations and the defilement of God's holy chosen land that he separated for Israel. So if you want more detailed information on this, get a hold of me through my website at the genesis6conspiracy.com. That's genesis6 with the number 6conspiracy.com and ask for the document and I will gladly send it to you. I send all my documents uh, at no charge. Just name the topic so I know um, what you're after as opposed to the show because I do a lot of shows. So not just here but elsewhere. So. Until next time, may God bless you abundantly, and I hope you enjoyed today's show.